Welcome to another broadcast of the Crossroads Bible Study here from Chad Neal. We are so glad that you tuned in with us tonight and we hope and pray that you will enjoy it with us as we discover truths and treasures from God's Word. Just quickly to look over um, what we have done so far, for tonight's lesson is the last one of Crossroads 1. Now looking back we did Growing in God, Anchored in God, Reflecting Jesus, Jesus' life and legacy, spiritual gifts, the use and abuse thereof, trusting your guide, one God, three persons, the mission of God, and then tonight we'll be looking at your role in God's plan. But before we do so, let us just unite in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity that you gave us through your grace, that we can gather around your word and look into the depths of you and discover this for ourselves and make it our own. Thank you that your spirit will lead and guide us and that you will be our light in this night. In Jesus' name, amen. So just an overview of tonight's lesson. We'll be looking at um, your role in God's plan, obviously. And so we start off with the strategy. Of God's plan and then the setback where we know that sin entered and then the Savior Jesus's mission as he came to redeem that original plan of God so looking at God's plan for the cosmos the Bible is God's story it tells of a great God 
who had a wonderful plan for creation, especially for man, the crown of his creation. But however, man rejected God and this great plan of his, and thus brought himself under the wrath of God. But God was not content to write him off and just start over. Instead, he set about restoring that original plan for creation by sending a savior to redeem man and make it possible for him to once again participate in God's purposes. So in short, the Bible is a record of human sin and a loving God who wants to rescue man from that sin. And during this lesson, we are going to study God's plan for the world he created. First, we will look at his original plan for creation as it was before sin entered into the world. We will learn how sin destroyed this original plan of him. Then we'll look at God's redemptive plan, how he set in motion a plan to restore this original plan and purpose for creation by sending a redeemer to undo the effects of the fall. So first, we, as we can see on the slide, to, to find out what's, uh, what God's original plan or purpose for the cosmos was, we have to ask two basic questions. Firstly, why did God create the world? And then secondly, why did God create man? Looking at these questions, firstly, why did God create the world? God created the world for his pleasure and his glory. And the most motivation for creation was God-centered, completely God-centered and not man-centered. And scripture are very clear that God created the cosmos, the world, the universe, for himself. And we can read this in Isaiah that the, the Lord makes it so clear that his only concern is his own glory. We can see in the slide, Isaiah 42, verse 8, it says that, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. Isaiah 43, verse 7 and 21 Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. And we see that the New Testament is equally clear about this. In Colossians 1, verse 16 and 18, we can read that all things were created by him and for him, and so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So looking at the strategy of creation, God's purpose for the world, firstly we see from these scriptures that God created the world for himself. Secondly, God created it for his glory. And then thirdly, God created it for his pleasure. Now we answered the question about why God created the world. Now looking at the second question, why did God create man? So God's purpose for man, as we can read in the slides, firstly was a relationship. God created man to enjoy him in love. And then secondly, rulership. God created man to exalt him in the labor that he does on earth. Let us just stand still here for a moment. If we look at the cosmos, the created universe, um, wonders of nature, it is easy to admit that we worship a great God. But we tend to forget that God is also the God of details, the, the most intricate details. He who created the cosmos and is found in the whole universe is also found in the smallest atom. And then looking at the crown of his creation, mankind. The Bible uses many examples um, of Moses, John, the old prophets, where God appeared to man, but he only did so partially. If God would appear to man in his full splendor and glory, our whole being would just disintegrate or disappear instantly. As we see in Revelation where John turned around and he fell at his feet as though it did when he saw Jesus. We see that when Moses, his face was shining as he was coming from the mountain when he received the stone tablets. And this is exactly why God had to appear as the Son of Man to the world. We tend to forget that God lovingly created man with so much complexity. We are all unique. 
Psalms 139 states this clearly, where it says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Just think of our eyes, our eyesight, the retina letting in light reflecting our vision, and each of that is unique in every person, even our fingerprints. Um, we know that in the secular world, this is also a form of identification, this uniqueness in every person. But a third factor, more known in the recent, the last decades, um, is the composition of our microbiome found in the gut. People share about 99.9% .9 of DNA, and this is exactly what separates us as a species. But microbiomes in the digestive system differs between 80 to 90%. That makes every person so unique. And this just emphasizes how fearfully and wonderfully we were made. Our DNA composition is so great, it, we know that this is a footprint of our being. Microbiome's composition, though, is 200 times greater than our DNA composition. Just thinking of the nerve endings in our digestive system, 500 million nerve endings, which is five times more than in the spinal cord. Our digestive system produces 90% of serotonin, which we know as the happy hormone. We can ask, well, why is this important? The most complex ecosystem is found in the human digestive system. And we can see that God spends so much extra time and effort in creating us to the finest little detail before he breathed his being into us. Now, since man is part of creation, he too was created for God's pleasure and glory, just as we see, saw in the scriptures before. And as that pinnacle of creation, the crown of creation, he was to be part, the part that brought the Lord the most pleasure and glory. Now, what does it mean to glorify God? God cannot be made more glorious than he already is. He cannot be improved, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. We can read that in Acts 17. To glorify does not mean to, to add more glory to God. Now, when God says that he created us for his glory, it cannot mean that he created us so that he would become more glorious. That is, his beauty and perfection would be somehow increased by us. It is totally unthinkable that God should become more perfectly God by making something that is not God. And it is more like the word magnify, to glorify. When you magnify like a telescope, you make something unimaginably great look like what it really is. And God created us for this, to display His glory. That is, that His glory might be known and praised. To live our lives in a way that makes Him look more like the greatness and the beauty and the infinite worth that He really is. And this is what it means to be created in the image of God. We are meant to image forth in the world what He is really like. God created man to enjoy intimate fellowship with him and glorify him by ruling over creation as his vice regent. And for this reason, God gave man a very precious gift, the gift of free will. Man had the freedom to choose to love and serve God, not from compulsion, but by choice, thus bringing his creator joy and honor. Secondly, we'll be looking at the setback from this great plan that God had. And we know that that was the fall of man's sin. The fall disrupted God's perfect plan for creation and forced him to set in place a plan of redemption so that his original plan could still be realized. The free will that God gave man also included the possibility that man would disobey God and choose not to honor and love him, which is exactly what happened. Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command and mankind fell into sin. And we know that from then on, all men have been born sinners, separated from God and his perfect plan for them. Sin had a massive impact on all creation. It did not only affect man and his relationship with God, it brought a curse upon the entire created world. That moment Eve took and ate the fruit, 
the whole created universe started spinning into a self-destruct. And as a result, God's ideal plan for creation suffered a major setback. Fallen creation did not reflect his glory the way that he intended. Neither did it bring him any pleasure anymore. We can see that sin affected every area of man's life. Intellectually, he rejected God's truth and descended into error. Emotionally, man became indifferent to God's love, resulting in unhappiness and a lack of fulfillment. He rejected God's authority and his will to become enslaved by sinful desires. Physically, man became subject to sickness, decay and death. Spiritually, his relationship with God was broken and he became subject to God's wrath and judgment. So in short, the glorious plan God had for all men, enjoying that intimate righteousness to glorify God, was all destroyed. Now if we look at the table on the slide, we can see what areas of man's personality, um, what was God's offer for that man's response and the progressive results in return. Looking at the mind, we see that God offers truth and man's response was unbelief and the progressive result of that was error. Looking at man's emotions, we see that God offered love and we responded in indifference, thus causing unhappiness. Looking at man's will, God offered authority. We responded in rebellion, thus setting us into slavery to sin. And then looking as a person, God's offer was Christ. And man's response was to reject Christ. And that causing death, eternal death. So far from being a place where God's presence was enjoyed, His righteousness displayed and His kingly authority embraced, the world became a place where Satan prevailed, sin pervaded and sickness prospered. Creation was no longer an uncontaminated reflection of the Lord's creative genius and his splendor. The Lord had two options, destroy it or redeem it. But fortunately for us, he chose to redeem it and he set in motion a plan to restore creation to its former glory so that it would once again fulfill its originally intended purpose. Being all-knowing, God knew creation would fall, and He chose in eternity to pass to redeem it. His dilemma as to whether to destroy or restore the fallen creation did not take Him by any surprise. The Bible calls Jesus a lamb chosen before creation of the world. We can read that in 1 Peter 1. And it says, God chose us in Him before the creation of the world. Ephesians 1. Continuing to the third point, the mission of Jesus, the redemptive plan of the Savior. We know that due to the fall, man lost his personal relationship with God and the cosmos fell under a curse. Being unwilling to give up on creation due to his love, the Lord set him a, a, a plan of redemption in motion. The central theme of the Bible is the progressive unfolding of this plan of God. Of redemption and we can refer to that as the scarlet thread of redemption that runs right through the entire Bible unifying this message and we can see that from beginning to end. Now looking at the word redemption it pictures buying back something that was lost by paying a ransom price so as to restore it to its rightful place and its original purpose. We know that redemption is a voluntary act of God's grace he did not have to redeem creation. It had no right to redemption. God chose to redeem it because he wanted to, not because he had to. And to redeem it, he had to pay a ransom price. He could not just bypass the judgment that was due to us. We know that he set that standard, that sin deserves death. So he sent his son to pay the ransom by dying the death that we should have died so that we could have life. In the Bible, God's plan of redemption unfolds in three stages, corresponding to three major actions on God's part. First stage was selecting Israel. The first step in God's plan of redemption was to select a nation through whom He could reveal Himself to the nations and through whom He would send the Messiah as the Savior of the world. And we know that He selected Israel for that. 
Secondly, we saw that the sending of Christ, the critical moment in God's mission arose when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save the world and restore God's rule. And through his ministry and his death, Christ atoned for sin, breaking the power of the curse that fell upon creation and restored God's kingly rule over creation. Thirdly, the, it was starting the church. With Satan being defeated, the curse broken and salvation secured, the final phase of God's plan was to spread the good news to all mankind. And starting the church, a people called out of the world to serve that purpose of God, was his chosen means of doing this. Our primary concern in this course is the role of the church in God's plan. But we cannot fully appreciate that until we understand Christ's mission during his first coming. Looking at the Redeemer's mission, you can follow on the slide, that Jesus came to save sinners. He came to atone for sin. He came to disarm the devil. And he came to restore God's rule. So what was Jesus' mission? Why did he come? That is, why did God become man and came to earth? The simple answer would be that Christ came to restore man's fellowship with God by a sacrificial death on the cross. This is a very accurate statement of Christ's purpose, but not the complete one. Looking at biblical statements describing his reasons for coming overlap, but together they can provide a complete picture of Christ's mission coming to earth. Firstly, we saw that Jesus came to save sinners. The scriptures are abundantly clear that one of Jesus' primary reasons for coming was to save sinners. Jesus considered this a very good, great priority. We read that in Luke 19 and John 3. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And Paul also summarized Christ's purpose for as a saving mission. In 1 Timothy 1, we can read that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So it is very clear that Jesus came to save sinners. It was one of the primary reasons he came. Secondly, we can see that Jesus came to atone for sin. So how did Jesus save the sinners? He saved them, he saved us by dying on our behalf to atone for their sin. Unless he had done so, we couldn't have been forgiven. Thus, in a real sense, Jesus came to die on the cross. And Jesus understood that his entire mission climaxed at the cross. For he said in Mark 10, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, for us. He saw the act of dying as the final fulfillment of his ministry, not as an act of defeat but of triumph. His dying words in John 19 verse 30, it is finished, shows that in dying for our sin, he had achieved his main aim, namely, atoning for sin. The Apostle Paul considered Jesus' atoning death as one of the main reasons he came to earth. We see that in 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. In Galatians 3, we read that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Thirdly, we see that Jesus came to disarm the devil. Jesus also came to nullify Satan's power and set free those being oppressed by him. Christ's death and resurrection once and for all destroyed the devil's authority over mankind. Reading in 1 John 3 verse 8, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. In Hebrews 2, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Lastly, in Colossians 2 verse 15, we read, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So we can see from all these scriptures that Jesus came to disarm the devil. And indeed he did so. Lastly, we see that Jesus came to usher in the kingdom of God. So while all of the above were part of Christ's mission, 
his real mission was to redeem creation and restore God's righteous rule over it. The main reason Jesus came was to usher in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the rule of God. Wherever God's kingly authority is recognized and embraced, the kingdom of God is present. The fall brought all creation under a curse, under the power of the devil. Christ came to undo that effect, the effects of the fall, to break Satan's power and to restore God's rule on earth. The ministry of Jesus is best understood as a power confrontation between two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil, between light and darkness, good and evil. Jesus' message and ministry show that his mission was to restore God's rule over all creation. We live in a period between two kingdoms. The ki kingdom of God has come, but the kingdom of darkness remains. And this is an age of conflict. The kingdom of God was at the heart of Jesus' message. His essential message was simply this. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The rule of God was also at the heart of his ministry. He devoted himself to three main tasks. Preaching the gospel, healing the sick, and casting out demons. And by doing these things, he was demonstrating the powerful arrival of this kingdom of God as it overpowered the kingdom of darkness. Jesus viewed his ministry as destroying the power of Satan's kingdom and ushering in the kingdom of God. We read in Matthew 4, verse 23 and 24, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. We read that when John the Baptist asked if Jesus was the Messiah, he did not answer with a simple yes or no. Instead, he told his disciples to report to John what was happening. He knew that John would recognize that through his ministry, the kingdom of God had arrived in power. We read in Matthew 11, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. We can look at the summary in this slide of the various ways in which Jesus' earthly ministry ushered in the kingly rule of God and supplanted the power of Satan's kingdom. So firstly, looking at the kingdom of darkness, which brought bondage, sickness, death, and error. We see that the ministering of Christ, he cast out those demons, he healed the sick, he preached the gospel, and he teached the word where there was error. And we see that in the kingdom of God, there is freedom from bondage. There is wholeness in place of sickness. There is life for death and truth in error. In summary then, Jesus came to restore God's kingly rule over all creation. The most important part of his mission was dying on a cross to break Satan's hold over us and to atone for our sin. But his mission was broader than that. The kingdom of God encompasses all of life. Thus Jesus' ministry saving the soul, healing the body, delivering from the devil, preaching the good news to the poor, and bringing justice to the oppressed was his ministry. It was his purpose for coming to us. And in everything, to remember that God created you and I with the specific smallest details out of his love for us. That we are so specifically unique that we are wonderfully and fearfully made, as it says in Psalms. Let us remember this going on with our journey through God's word. Let us just unite in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, your truth, that we could discover who you are for, for the purpose of your creation, for your purpose in creating us, and for that fine, finest detail that you implemented in us 
as you designed us so uniquely. Thank you that we can remember that we are the crown of your creation, but above all that you are the creator. And thank you that we can worship you as the creator, the only one, the true God. And we can do everything in our lives to glorify you, to bring you pleasure, because that brings pleasure to us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and for the leading of the Holy Spirit and your blood protecting and covering us in this night to come. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace and the grace of God be with you. Amen.